They've sent agents in on me. They've sent agents provocateur in on me. Every time I go to an airport, they've got PIs or Scientologists confronting me. Hello, I'm Ben Shapiro, and welcome to Vice Meets. My guest today is Marty Rathbun, a former senior executive of the Church of Scientology who left the church in 2004. He's a key subject of Alex Gibney's new documentary, Going Clear, Scientology and the Prison of Belief, which is being released this month through HBO Films. Someone had told me there's this cult and they'll make anything possible in your life. I was deeply convinced that we were going to save the world. It was a transcendent experience. You feel euphoric. Everything you do for endless trillions of years depends on what you do within in Scientology. They sell it all in the beginning as something quite logical. You take on a matrix of thought that is not your it's own. It's so strong that it sticks you like very glue. Very controlled, very suggestible. You just don't see it happening to you. You justify so much. There is no logical explanation other than faith. Marty, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. When we talk about religion, we generally are talking about Things like worshiping, talking about things like maybe God, spirituality. But Scientology doesn't seem to work like that. Can you just, in a very basic way, tell me what is Scientology? It's a therapy, basically. I mean, the first book was Dianetics of Modern Science of Mental Health, and that was her ab reaction therapy, where if you go back and you know you go back to an earlier time and an earlier time for a particular type of upset, you get to the basic on it, and then that whole area of concern or consideration kind of dissolves and is no longer a problem. Um, Scientology was developed a few years later when Dianetics proved not to be as 100% um, workable as Hubbard you know, claimed it would be. And Scientology was a lot more loose. It was a lot more sort of mental exercises where we, we would free associate a lot more. I wouldn't just keep you on the stringent thing where I'd say, okay, go earlier, go earlier, go earlier. I'd say, tell me about women, you know. Tell me more about women, okay? You know, I would, I would just open up this. And so the whole thing is, it capitalizes on the fact um, that was discovered by Carl Rogers. Actually, you could say it was discovered by Sigmund Freud. You probably actually say it was discovered by some ancients, you know, who never wrote it up. But when somebody really listens to somebody and treats them with unconditional positive regard, it opens you your ability to look at yourself and communicate about yourself like you never would otherwise, and you would never do with your alone with yourself. So it's a very cathartic, transcendent type of experience. And so that's the core, okay? But here's the problem. It's not just you and that auditor, you and that counselor. It's you, me, and this massive Byzantine bureaucracy that's behind me that I'm actually working for. And so it's not unconditional positive regard. It's positive regard conditioned on you ultimately keeping my trust, which represents the trust of all these other people, including L. Ron Hubbard. And so conditions upon condition is entered in subtly and slowly. And by the end of it, it becomes literally, truly, you're now being fed this sort of whole world view, universe view, which is touched on in the documentary, which people on the outside look at and go, well, that's just batshit crazy. Um, you know, over time and over all, a lot of these little kind of little peak experiences, or as Jason Begay put it, these little transcendent experiences, you start buying into it. You are a member of the Church of Scientology for 26 years, ultimately becoming the Inspector General for the Religious Technology Center. What does the rest of the world look like when you're so deep in that world? It looks like um, people who aren't really serious, who are really just pursuing materialistic ends, um, aren't really uh, aware or even caring enough to really see the 
the, the, the deep problems uh, of the psyche and of, and of society. And, you know, and they even have a word for it. They, 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 there's a word. Non-Scientologists are referred to as WOGs. And WOGs comes from uh, Imperial Britain, and that was the word for non-whites when they were taking over places like India and China, or the Oriental gentlemen. And that literally is a, th a term that hovered, and, and they're talk about it right now. You know, Tom Cruise and talk, Dave, Mus I mean, this is just part of their daily vernacular, uh, daily vocabulary. Oh, those wogs don't get it. They're just wogs. And so, you, you, you know, you, you have this sort of idea that then turns into this sort of superiority idea that everybody else is clueless. I think that there's a pretty widespread assumption that Scientology may be a fraud or a cult, but there's still an enduring appeal that brings new people into the church and is very appealing for, for young people, for old people, for people of all different types of people. What is that appeal? I don't, I don't see this appeal to young people. No? I don't see this appeal to new people, but it's, it's, it's this kind of uh, way to improve your life that, it, that, that, they, that they tell you is going to improve it, and they tell you with just utter, absolute certainty. And... Um, you know, which, which is something a lot of people are looking for. They're looking for some sort of certainty. They're looking for some sort of um, direction. Um, but ultimately, certainty, taken too far, um, you know, becomes radicalism, becomes sociopathy, actually. You know, the person who has no doubts, never doubts anything, is totally, utterly certain all the time. Um, that's kind of a sickness, actually. You're known as the Wayne Gretzky of auditing, uh, a key process of bringing new people into Scientology. I wanted to know if you wouldn't mind giving us a demonstration and showing me how that process works. What we're really doing here, the, the auditing process really is a form of psychotherapy that already existed prior to Hubbard. R really it reflects more than anything sort of the, the general principles of Rogerian and Carl Rogers created client-centered therapy. Hubbard sort of souped up that whole process by introducing into the equation an electropsychometer. And this is a resistance detector, essentially. All it does is detect uh, electronic resistance within a field. He wasn't the first one. Carl Jung was f fiddling around with one of these at the uh, turn of the century before last. And as noted in the documentary, it's one-third of the components of a lie detector. So there is some sort of, you know, you're adding some sort of, you know, certainty and direction by doing this. I would get you to talk to me. Um, I'm gonna do this, that we, we set up this. It's probably better if you do it this way because you don't know, tangle up the... I would get us talking about different areas you might consider contain some level of stress. Such as? Well, I don't know, you tell me. A level of stress? Yeah. I have some concerns about whether or not I'm doing the right thing with my life causes me some considerable amount of stress. I want to make sure that I do the right thing. Doing the my, right thing. I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing, not just in my profession, but in my personal life, my relationships. I am getting, uh, I'm getting a movement on, you know, on that subject of doing the right thing and figuring out how to do the right thing. Um, so this would be a subject that I would take up because it shows that there's some kind of sort of stress there is connected with it. You know, a lot of times you and I might be talking, but, but nothing's reading. Mm. Um, and the, the idea with this is it reads just under your level of c conscious awareness. And then as we got to an area where you sort of had some feeling of resolution to it, our needle would kind of just go into a floating pattern indicating there's no resistance. And, and, and that's essentially how, how it would, would work. You know, I said it's a one component mm -hmm. of a lie detector. Well, in fact, it's used in a very similar fashion. You know, as you go along, there's this tremendous fixation on you disclosing absolutely everything to me and having no kind of withholding. And I would use this to assist me to get to the bottom of it. Historically, Scientology has been vehemently opposed to psychiatry and to the pharmaceutical industry. I wanted to ask you, what is the perceived threat from the existence of those areas? This all began in the 50s when you had institutional psychiatry, when you had most of mental health was being sort of used, was state controlled. You know, there's a lot of different things that are posited through the lectures of Hubbard and the writing of Hubbard, but, you know, ultimately, it's all sort of bullshit because 
you know, I, I was, I'm familiar with a lecture that he did in 1952 where he was saying, you know what, I've picked psychiatry as a, as an enemy because there, because it, you need that in order to have a tight knit group. A tight knit group must have an enemy, and they're in the same line of country as us, and they screwing up all the time. So it's a, it's a, it's a choice of convenience, and you know, and I think that you know he was some somewhat serious about that then, but much like the rest of Scientology, you know. In the early days, and a lot of the early things he did, he had a pretty acute, interesting mind, and he had an interesting way that he melded a bunch of different things together. But the more serious he took himself, um, and that's a good example of it on this whole mental health thing. So he goes from joking about doing it just for purposes of having an enemy, 18 years later, he's writing stuff about how these people truly are evil beings who've been beamed in from another planet. You know, that shows you the evolution, and it shows you the danger of taking yourself seriously. He ultimately wrote very specific stuff about how psychiatrists, psychs in general, people involved in mental health at any level, psychologists, are a special breed of being who, who um, were, were bred on a planet called Farsec, and they came to this planet at some point or another for one reason and one reason alone, and that mission was to keep humanity ignorant and enslaved. And so um, he wrote that in all seriousness to the highest levels of the church to sort of uh, inspire them to, to, to invest in these activities to destroy, destroy psychiatry. I don't know how you can destroy a subject, but but that's where, that's, where it, that's where it devolved into. I wanted to ask you about when you left the church in 2004, uh, you moved to Texas and began um, an independent auditing program. Uh, how long did you do that for? About four years. Four years? So there was still an appeal for no, you. Not, not really. If you look no. at my webpage, and this is, this is something that's been misunderstood, and it's, it's, it's one of the things that Scientology tried to use as a justification for harassing me and my wife. If you look at my, my webpage, my blog, markrathman.wordpress.com, my statement page, my title page, my welcome page has been the same statement I've had there since the day I went online. And I stayed in there that I draw from a number of different subjects, including Scientology, in order to help somebody get through the um, leaving Scientology experiment. And so what I was saying, though, that you know, one, one of the things that I would do is I would correct what Scientology misapplied to the person, okay? That's the first step. Beyond that, I'm, I'm educating them, increasing their horizons mm -hmm. to help them kind of get, move on from it. Mm -hmm. Is that because you don't think that there's a possibility for a reform movement within the church or? Well, no, I did, I did you know, um, serve as a, as, as, as a reform agent. You know, I was working to, to get them to reform. I mean, initially I thought, um, you know, they could reform. And then I thought, um, and I did encourage people to go out and, pr and practice Scientology independently for that very reason, because I did, I studied the Reformation, the Christian Reformation. The Christian Re Reformation wasn't a re reorganizing of the Catholic Church. The Christian Reformation was people saying, you're not the only show in town, and you're not the only, you, you don't own the, the patent and copyright to this. You know, we could take that same book and practice it the way we, we see fit. And so I did encourage that, and that there was some of that. But I gotta tell you, it wasn't long before I realized that the behavior patterns um, and the, um, the, the things that create these odd behavior patterns, patterns ran much deeper than, than just you know, something that the church was doing. I saw it happening with the people on the outside, and I suggested um, real simple, um, th you know, I, I gave three pieces of advice. I wrote a book called What is Wrong with Scientology? And I said, in order for Scientologists to make this a viable subject in the future, and relevant at all, they're gonna to have to learn to integrate, they're gonna to have to learn to evolve, and they're gonna to have to learn to transcend. And you gotta got to learn to take, not take yourself so seriously and look at a lot of this stuff from Hubbard as allegorical or parable, um, but if to take it literally, um, 
is, is a problem. Well, that was the most, that, that was like heresy. I mean, and I'm talking about the people who are outside of the church. And I realized these guys who were even outside of the church were just as much in a prison of belief as the ones inside. And that's where I sort of, then I spent the last three or four years really deconstructing the subject and realizing how that came to be. Um, You've been speaking out about Scientology for years now, but I do think that this film is gonna introduce a whole new set of people to your concerns, to the things that concern you about the movement. When you were asked to participate in the film, did you hesitate at all? Out of maybe fear of some kind of retribution? Was there anything that went through your mind? Were you concerned at all? No, this, in a way, this film is sort of the culmination and the, the, the best comprehensive telling of what I've been through for the past six years. I've been talking about this, writing about it, um, you know, and, and I think the, what, the, what the real contribution of this film is, I think it is going to do for the media what I've done with former members. You know, I, I said from the beginning to the former members, when enough of you stand up and stop kowtowing to their, to their abusive sort of terroristic kind of policies, you're going to hit a tipping point where nobody will, they can't keep up with all that. They've only got so many resources. They operate like organized crime. They go make an example of somebody and then tell everybody else, look it, you all need to be afraid of us, you all need to shut up. The media has been like, th been like that to quite an extent. Alex and HBO are the first ones, major, credible ones that have done a comprehensive piece like this, chronicling all this, that did not kowtow to Scientology. They did, they, they did not um, submit to Scientology controlling the cycle and spinning it and influencing it and, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's why I think it's significant. What kind of harassment have you been the target of following the types of, uh, of, of reports that you've been releasing? Well, you know, a lot of it's chronicled in the film. They've sent agents in on me. They've sent agents provocateur in on me. Every time I go to an airport, They've got PIs or Scientologists confronting me. And then, of course, for an extended period of time, they, they've just parked right in front of our house. And every time my wife and I leave, they've been in our face with cameras. Who is David Miscavige? And can you describe your relationship with him? He was a, a messenger for Hubbard, which was sort of this a group of teenagers, sons and daughters of Scientologists that were in the priesthood. Who Hubbard was grooming uh, as to be leaders, um, and he was the most sort of aggressive, most you know loyal to Hubbard of, of the lot. And so it was no uh, surprise that he rose to the top amongst them. And he was picked by Hubbard to lead this whole defense of of the church. And and, and when I first worked with him in the early '80s, um, you know I sort of considered that I was working with a guy who was you know kind of uh, felt like I was working for the underdog, um, and, um, and 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 frankly, when we were in that role, uh, he was a lot more agreeable, a lot more, you know, decent to work with. But as time went on, he got he began to get control and power. Hubbard died, then he had another power struggle with another, and he got complete control, then absolute power, absolutely corrupted. And I watched this this dwindling dwindling spiral of the guy it became increasingly. Uh, motivated by wanting to be in the inner circle with this whole celebrity life of the rich and famous clique, um, obsessed with his own image, paranoid beyond belief, creating group confessions to get to the bottom of what kind of intentions lurk, might be lurking within the ranks against him. I mean, like Stalin-esque type of stuff. And so it was a. And so I, I witnessed the whole sort of bell curve. You know, his rise and fall. Mm. What are some of these abuses that Scientology has committed against its members? They have to do with breaking up families. They have to do with making people work for, or inducing them to work long hours for no, mm -hmm. no pay. Cutting them off from the outside world so they're not evolving and staying in tune with the way the world's progressing. Um, and then, but, and, 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 and incidentally, you know, and this is where, you know, I, I, I I can speak more from first-hand knowledge, and also I think it's more relevant to the outside world. Um, 
you know, they, they, take, they go to extreme measures to, as I've described, to silence dissent or to, or to silence criticism. Um, and I think that's what, what people should focus on more than anything. What they do within their four walls, this is America, you know, you could worship the dollar and you, you know, and you're, you're okay. Once they step out of those four walls and they start hounding and hunting and terrorizing people, then, then they're not privileged to do that. And that should, they should go under the microscope. And they should be, and there should be uh, action by, by 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 the authorities that be. I don't plan on on joining any religious group. Why should I be concerned? Is there anything that could negatively affect me about the existence of Scientology, or is it really just not necessarily? I, in fact, that's what I said. I mean, there's all these people saying all this stuff. I'm not on the. I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not part of the pack. But they're saying they're going to lose their exemption. Tom Cruise is going to be shamed into leaving. I don't know about any of that. I think I think what it does is it's, it's, it does a great service to inform people what the consequences are of being involved in it. And I think that's as much as you could ask for. And and that's what I think it does. I think it's the best thing that's ever been done along that line. You know, Scientology can't compete in the marketplace of ideas when it's a level playing field. He just leveled the playing field by saying, I'm not gonna be intimidated by you to let you rewrite or edit what I do. I'm gonna take a look from people who actually know and, um, and put it out there. Well, anyway, Marty, thank you so much for joining us today. All right, thanks for having me. Take All care. Right.